All right, awesome. So thank you everyone for joining us and attending this session on energy efficient houses. We're very excited to have you here and we're excited to share our home energy efficiency tips with you. A little bit of housekeeping, uh, captions are available in your settings on Zoom. We also will be recording this session for future reference. And we do ask that all participants keep their video and microphone off. We will have time for a question and answer session at the end. So please feel free to put your questions in the chat at any time. I will be keeping track of them and we'll be sharing them with the team uh, during the Q&A portion. And we're gonna kick things off with a land acknowledgement. Whoop. Sorry about that, everyone. There we go. Okay, so just starting off with a land acknowledgement for our live le learning session today. Just want we want to honor the Indigenous people who have lived and worked on this land historically and presently. Uh, Green Venture recognizes that our work is on traditional territory of Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, Adirondack, Mississauga, and Mississauga of the Credit First Nation and that we are situated upon lands protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement. We acknowledge that Green Venture is also part of this agreement uh, and being committed to stewards of the land. And we would like to further uh, recognize that this land is covered by the Between the Lakes Purchase of 1792, which was instituted between the Crown and the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. We at Green Venture are very much committed to engaging in necessary learning, building of relationships and action required towards reconciliation between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples in our community. And feel free to check out native-land.ca if you are tuning in uh, outside of Hamilton today just to see what uh, traditional territory you are situated upon. So going into our uh, today's session. I just want to introduce all of us here as your speakers today. Uh, so myself, my name is Dee. I am the Energy Program Assistant at Green Venture with our uh, Energy Efficiency Program, uh, as well as uh, we have Nicole as well here. And Nicole is our Energy Program Coordinator here with the Energy Program at uh, Green Venture. And then we also have Dave Braden, who is our local expert for today. Uh, he is the co-founder of Braden Homes, and he is also a former Hamilton City Councilor. Dave is uh, a seasoned energy expert. He has a background in sustainable development and social activism. He graduated from Antioch College in 1972, followed by a Master of Science degree from the University of Toronto in 1975. Dave co-founded Braden Homes, known for constructing highly energy efficient houses in Ontario from 1980 to 2010. And he has a passion for sustainable living, is currently planning a pioneering pilot project aimed at advancing energy efficiency in housing, reflecting his lifelong commitment to minimizing fossil fuel consumption and promoting sustainable lifestyles. We also would really like to thank Environment Hamilton and uh, the Office of Climate Change Initiatives uh, through the city of Hamilton. Both Ian and Linda have been really supportive of all of our live learning sessions as this is an ongoing series and we really uh, do thank them for uh, their support with us. Um, so just wanted to acknowledge that as well. Uh, if you were interested in checking out Green Venture as a, a nonprofit organization located in Hamilton, we do uh, have a variety of programming uh, focused on not just energy and energy efficiency, but we also do programs focused on community greening, local food growing, uh, green infrastructure programs, as well as nature-based education and youth climate action programs. Uh, but in the energy efficiency side of things, uh, our, our energy program has been conducting home ev energy evalu evaluations for over 20 years, and we've been helping to uh, help existing homes create more energy efficient uh, buildings, 
reduce their greenhouse gas emissions and to live more comfortably in their homes. So thank you so much for joining us today. And we're gonna jump into our outline. I'll pass it over to Nicole. Yes, so for our session today, we are gonna start out with a little bit of context about the current situation with climate change and how the way that we engage in our homes, heating and cooling them contributes to greenhouse gas emissions. We will do a light introduction to energy efficiency. We're gonna talk about the hierarchy of retrofit needs and per the topic of this session, ways that you can start small. We're also gonna talk about the heat loss problem in our homes. After that, we're gonna share three projects to get you started, um, small changes, easy to do, quick, cheap and easy is our focus for the day. After that, we'll talk about some next steps and places that you can go and how you can get started when you're ready to do more. Following that, we'll have a question and answer session. Awesome. So getting into the context, where are we headed with all of this in regards to climate change? And uh, how can we situate our discussion today around energy efficiency at home? So uh, going into the Paris Climate Agreement, which is uh, which was signed on through the United Nations and 196 countries in 2015, they all signed a legally binding international treaty on climate change, um, which committed everyone who signed uh, to net zero emissions by the year 2050. So just situating where we're going with this, what is net zero, what does that mean? Net zero essentially means that we produce as much energy as we consume. So if we have a net zero house, that means we generate electricity at the, at the same rate that we use it. Essentially, this helps us to uh, lower our emissions reductions uh, that we use at home. So just situating where we are going with that. And going into why this is important, why is, um, you know, talking about energy efficiency and our building emissions important in the context of climate change? Well, that is because buildings make up 46% of all of the GTHA, so Greater Toronto Hamilton Area emissions as of 2022. Uh, these are the highest levels that we have seen from the building sector alone since 20, 2015 when the Paris Climate Accord was signed. So uh, primarily we are seeing this, the biggest chunk here uh, come from natural gas and uh, natural gas use at 89% in people's homes and buildings. And this uh, natural gas use is used primarily for space and water heating. Yeah, so to talk a little bit about retrofitting your home, we work within a slight methodology of the hierarchy of retrofit needs, meaning that we encourage you to start towards the bottom. So you can reduce your home's carbon footprint. For a lot of people, that's a very big task. It's very daunting and it requires a lot of planning and information. When you start from the bottom, you're able to implement lifestyle changes or free and low cost upgrades and then you can work your way upwards to eventually make even more reductions in your home's emissions it's perfectly fine to start with the small steps it's very hard to get started updating or retrofitting your home there's a lot of changes that you can make in your home independently and you can get started today oh sorry there we go and Dave, uh, would you like to speak about the heat loss problem? Should I jump right in? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. My name's Dave Braden, and I, I understand this business quite well. And uh, rather than first jumping in and saying, you should do this and you should do that, because I tell you, that doesn't go over very well. I just need to reemphasize something that is so simple, but that we need to, we need to review it. We need to understand what this problem is with energy and housing. And as the speaker just said, you know, it, it looks daunting, it looks overwhelming, and it looks like you have to pay huge amounts of money. I want to try to simplify it because if we can feel confident about doing little small jobs that will, will make a, a real improvement, 
you'll be more motivated to at least consider these, if not do them. So the diagram that you see in front of you, uh, this was done by a Green Venture, so I thank them for it, is, is to emphasize an issue that you've heard repeated, but the message is not getting understood and it's not getting uh, uh, pro properly assessed. In, in, in the three diagrams you see all side by side, and I'm looking at them the same as you are, you see uh, your heated house. This is important to visualize this because I'm gonna talk about the importance of air leakage. So the air in your house that unintentionally finds its way from inside the house after it's been heated and you pay good money to, to heat it and, and what happens to that air. Before I explain that, I just, I wanna say something that, that isn't just a, a trick. And that is, we don't technically heat houses. We, we don't put our house in a gigantic oven and heat the whole darn thing. Uh, that, and no, nobody thinks we do. We always, almost always, heat the air first. And we hope that by heating the air, the air will in fact heat all the material and the mass inside the house to make us comfortable. Because that's what comfort is. When everything is roughly the same temperature and if it's warm, then we feel comfortable and that's what we want. That's what we want in the middle of January when it's freezing, we want to feel warm and comfortable. If you look at the diagram on the left, it indicates that the air inside the house is warm and air outside is cold. This is a scientific fact which is not being understood and, and uh, considered strongly. If you take the middle drawing, what happens in your house after one hour, and this isn't hippy dippy gobbledygook, this is scientific fact that is not respected and appreciated by at least 95% of the population. After one hour, about half the air volume in your house has already found its way unintentionally outside. This is a fact that you need to wrap your head around because this shows how serious air leakage is. Air leakage is not about a tiny little window left a crack open. This is half the heated area half the energy you have spent to warm up your house is gone in half an hour through the air. So again, I'm gonna keep two concepts straight. Half of the air that's warmed up to 72 degrees Fahrenheit in one hour is gone. Now that, if that's not bad enough, you have to consider what goes along with it. If that air has gone from your house Clearly, the air needs to be replaced with some other air. So the middle diagram shows that half of the warm air has gone. So that's half your money out the window. It's now being replaced by freezing cold air from outside. Again, that whole idea, the purpose of this drawing is to show you how serious air leakage is to sort of complete the, the two hour cycle. If you look at the drawing on the right, after two hours, and, and this, I didn't say this, but if your house is on the, on the better side of average, this happens. If your house is on the worst side of average, you probably lose all of your air in one hour. So what this is, and, and it's hard to accept because this is 10 times more important than anybody thinks it is. But again, what's happening is we are spending all of our money to heat air. That air is only temporarily staying in our house. And what you're really doing is you're heating the neighborhood and you're running up a huge energy bill. It's bad for everybody except your, your provider of, of fuel. So with that, and I urge you to think about that carefully because people just don't get this. Now, in perspective, house lose heat in two ways. What I've just talked about here is how it loses the warm air. Not to be too complicated, but we lose heat two ways. We lose it in the air 
And this air does a fair job finally of, of warming up all the mass inside the house. At that heat of particularly the outside wall, we lose by a process called conduction. And we sort of understand conduction. It's like the, you know, the old fire, uh, the cast iron frying pan on the stove. You know, it, it, it heats up when you're making bacon and eggs or whatever, and you grab the handle and the handle is hot. So the heat from the bottom of the frying pan moves without exception from hot to cold. Same things happens on your outside wall. You get the drywall or the plaster a little bit warmed up and that heat is dissipated into the cold outside. So there's two processes of heat loss. We've just seen that we lose all our warm air within two hours. So in that process, it's gone in two hours. Convection, you hope, is a lot slower. So I want to talk, I, I, there's not the time to talk about the air loss and the heat loss through conduction. I want to go back to the first main problem because it's a problem that can be solved. You can work at it for very little money, very little skill, and you can feel good about it. You don't have to be overwhelmed by $20,000 heat pumps or, or, or huge amounts of money. What I'm going to tell you is something that everybody should at least consider, and all of those that can should do these things. And if you're going to build a house that's really environmentally efficient, these three little things that I'm going to tell you really make a difference. So let me start with a prop. I'm going to talk about three things. The first one is, is to deal with, again, the air, the idea of heat loss. It's in the attic. If you can picture yourself in the attic, this is a drawing, this is a side view, and then uh, the side view is the one on the top, and the other one is a sky view looking down. So I'm going to ask um, the technicians to allow me to use a prop to tell you what I'm showing here. What, what, what I'm going to explain to you is the importance of sealing around the toilet stack. The toilet stack is a pipe like this. It takes all of the smell away from sewage and other kind of waste that goes down your plumbing system. And this by itself is nothing, but the way these are installed is, is critical as far as trying to minimize the air loss in your house outside. So if you can see these props, I will try to inform you about what the problem is and how to fix it. If you were in your attic and you were walking, this would be the ceiling. These would be the bottom of the trusses. It actually sits like this. And you will find that the toilet stack, the pipe, is sitting something like this. Now that pipe is about three or four inches in diameter. When this is installed at the very early part of building a house process, the, the installer of the pipe cuts, I'm gonna sit down, cuts a big X, probably as big as a basketball, at least as big as a football, in order to put this pipe that'll be making its way through the roof and making it down to service all of the plumbing in the house. This is not a criticism of the plumber or the builder. This is always being done. The building code and, and uh, the provincial government has made no attempt to try to help you understand how important this is. This is huge. Now, it's just overlooked. It doesn't matter. Blaming doesn't get anywhere. What we want to do is solve this problem. So here, here is the simplest way to solve the problem. I have something that hopefully you can see. It's a sort of a rubberized uh, piece of material, probably technically not rubber. It's fairly flexible. And you can see it has built into, it's formed into this thing, the size that this pipe fits 
tightly in into into around that pipe. This thing is called a neoprene flashing. It costs between eleven and fifteen dollars, and its purpose is to be put on the roof and merged into uh, a layer of uh, cedar uh, of asphalt shingles to make a sealed tight fit in the shingles so your roof doesn't leak. So here's what you do. If if I can ask the technician to please put back the the diagram. Sorry to be so long winded here. This is important. No, that's okay. I am I'm putting it back now. Okay. Sorry, just give me one second there. Okay, if you see the drawing on the top, the the two uh, uh, like rectangles with X's on them. They are, they are supposed to represent the pieces of wood that go up across the attic at, at the floor level, so the floor of the attic. The pipe is the black pipe. The pipe that you see running up and down that's supposed to represent a pipe is the black pipe. The, the piece of material where there's a, uh, an arrow right there, who's ever making that arrow go there, that's the neoprene flashing that what you do first is you cut the pipe right, right, right through it in the attic, you do, or somebody you hire, you slide the neoprene flashing down. The two little black dots are caulking, black caulking. And I'll show you a picture of the kind of caulking to use. So what's going on here is you're using this flexible material to push right down. And immediately under those black dots are pieces of polyethylene. So this is like poly or house wrap or it's, it's a plasticky kind of material that is in every house since built since maybe 1960. So it's there. So this simple device pushed down there and sealed by caulking into the original uh, poly will make an airtight seal so that instead of this hole that was as big as a basketball, there is now, uh, not in theory, but in practice, there's no hole. There's no air leakage through there at all. And then you put insulation back and fill it up uh, around the pipe. Where you cut the pipe before, you get a little piece of pipe that's called a coupling. It really joins two pieces of pipe together. You push the pipe together, you walk out of there, and the job is perfect. So that's, it, it, it's a little, I, I leave you with this message because you, you need to think about it. Not a lot of people necessarily will do it. But this is a solution and, and it needs to be done. Let me go to a second one. And these all get easier. So if you just stick with the last one, you'll be fine. So the last one is, right, let's talk about the diagram first. You're also, picture yourself in the attic. You're uh, up in the attic. You're looking, first of all, the top one is a cross section. The, 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 the two rectangle pieces are the pieces that run horizontally across the floor of the attic. So somebody has to walk on those so you don't, you don't step on the drywall and go right through. And the, uh, there's a little box. I'm gonna ask the technician to please get me to a prop because I'm gonna show you from the prop and then we'll go back to the drawing. This is what you would see if you were looking down. So what I have, these pieces here, would be the pieces that run across your attic from side to side and they hold up the drywall. This piece actually sits like this. So this is the attic floor. This is the structure that's holding up the drywall, but I'm turning it like this. This is what you see on top of where there will be a light fixture. This is a metal octagon box where we make connections with wires they're made in an electrical box, presumably from safety and sparks and all that kind of thing. When the electrician installs this box, there needs to be the vapor barrier, and it's hard to see in this picture, but there's a piece of poly where my hand is, all the way around here. That needs to be cut so that when you put your light fixture underneath here, you know, that, that, that vapor barrier can't be there, otherwise you wouldn't be able to put them together. So it's cut. It isn't cut neatly. There's no effort to make, to seal around this whole crack. 
So by and large, that's that's equivalent to about a 16 inch airway where air can escape from any light fixture on the upper level of your house into the attic. These are collectively terrible. Again, there's no blame here. We need to solve this problem and we want a, a 10 cent fix for this problem. If you see the black line, the black line here is to emphasize where you would put black caulking all the way around here, up the side of this board, down here and around. Then you put a patch of poly that might be 15 inches square and you put it on top and seal it into that black all the way around. When that's finished and you can look at it and say, that's now perfect, you put the insulation back on. N nothing is simpler. It's a pain in the neck to go out there. You need good balance, but this is a huge problem and this is overlooked. And please consider this. Do not go, no matter if you're getting free insulation or a big grant, do not insulate your whole attic before you do this around every light fixture and maybe the bathroom fan in the bathroom uh, until that's done. Because once you insulate it with maybe 16 inches or 24 inches of insulation, the chances of you pulling all that away and going back and fixing this are zero. So that's, that's how you do that. And uh, let me just mention here, caulking. If you've, most people have operated with a caulking gun before. This, this is a caulking tube. This is a caulking gun, it's a big one. It's real simple. You know, if you're six years old or more and under a hundred, you, you can operate this machine. It's not a machine, you just pull the trigger. But the important word is here, acoustical. That's the word, that's the kind of caulking you want to use. Do not just use a tube of caulking you've got sitting around. This stuff is like, is like fairly new chewing gum, always sticky, always soft. That's what you want. Let's go back to the, the, the drawing and make sure that I finished my little chat on that because I think I have. So top drawing, the, the upside down U is that octagon box. The two black sort of thicker lines, the, the, the thicker blue uh, black line is the electrical wire heading and going into the box. I didn't show the wires being joined together. The little thin black line at the top is the plastic seal that you put on and the little black dots are the caulking. So you seal it on top. So you can see the theory here is we're just air sealing that whole area. Then we're adding the insulation. The bottom drawing is, is a sky view. The octagon box you know, has octagon sides, thick wire coming into the side. The, the, where there is a black dot, the black dot is where you put the caulking and the inverted C around the outside uh, the, the wider one is the patch you're putting on top. So clearly the cost of doing this is about 10 cents. You can, you can just figure the number of bedrooms in a hall light fixture. You might have six of these in your attic. These are worth doing. Now, let me move now to the basement. And this will, uh, it, it applies to anywhere, but I, I want to, some people are a little... Uh, more interested in doing something in the basement. I just want to jump in and say, if anyone does have questions, feel free to put them in the chat as Dave is going along and we will have yeah. a and a at the end. Okay. Okay. I, I'm going to ask my technical support to, uh, to, to get this prop here. And, and I, I, I want to urge you to take this very seriously. Th this, first of all, this is my little prop that I used it. it, it, it this, is, this is an electrical box. Again, this is like the octagon box in the attic, but this is what you find on any wall. But let's just, we'll just uh, limit this conversation right now to basements. And let's say you've got the basement wall framed and you haven't, well, maybe you've got the drywall on, maybe you don't, but you, you want to improve the basement because you know that the basement's probably worth at least 20% of your heat loss 
And why not fix it? Or why not start there to learn about this? So this is, this is conventional framing. He, he, the electrician puts this box on. Uh, he's going to put some wires that come into this box and maybe join. Maybe this is going to be a plug for what TV. And then when, when construction follows its conventional approach, this gets insulated. And then the poly guy puts poly on. But of course, you have to cut this so that you can put the plug there. So this ends up being a hole about four, four inches by two inches, eight square inches, and they don't cut it tight. <coughs> they, they do that and they're in a hurry. It says, this is not a problem they created. This is a problem of conventional misunderstanding. This is, this is what goes on behind your drywall. And this is a big problem. So I want to try to show you how you can fix it. Uh, if you are not comfortable um, taking apart some electrical wires and turning them off and making sure you're not going to have a safety accident, uh, then, then go ahead with this. If, if those things frighten you or make you nervous, then please just consider the message and hire somebody to do this. I want to show you what can work and what can work pretty quick, pretty easily. Another prop. This, you, you, can, you can use this, you can buy this cheapy little piece of plastic at any building center. And I, they might call it a receptacle sealing box. I'm not sure what the proper name is or even there has a name. But it's, let me get my props. The purpose of this is we're gonna try to make an air sealed receptacle box so that it's not one of the problems. The number that you're gonna have in your house is gonna be between 20 and 30. Right now we're just trying to do the basement to make the basement really, really good. So eventually, when you, if you've got a receptacle box in the basement, you disconnect the wires, you make sure everything is safe and you probably take the existing box, if it's already up there, you take it off the wall. You use one of these plastic things and you can make this out of poly. It doesn't have to be a square. You can make it out of a flat piece. If you can wrap a Christmas present or an anniversary present, you can make this out of a sheet of poly for less than 10 cents. And you're going to apply it in such a way that the electrician or you is going to install the electrical box inside that box. At some point, you're going to have to make a hole in this, in this plastic box through the panel. And that's going to be where you then can put a piece of wire that is going to enter the box. At the point where it enters the box, preferably against something solid, but don't worry about that. You make a little hole. That, that tube of caulking, you put a big dab of that caulking on the hole, and you're ready to put the wire in, but because you only want to do this once for the next 50 years, you do this. You find a piece of flexible rubber material, and in fact, you have them sitting around. You got an old bicycle, um, tire and tube. It's got a flat tire. It's been sitting around your garage for 20 years. You take that tube out and you cut a little tube, uh, uh, square out of about two inches by two inches. And on top of this, where you've got the hole and you got the, the big dab of caulking, now you put this little patch of two by two. First, you make a little hole in it. Then you put that on there as well. Then you staple it. And then you think it's going to seal the, no air is going through there. Then the wire goes in there. Now, now you can put your receptacle on this. And in the end, just a minute here, you're going to put a piece of poly on the front. And here's, I want to mark this. Before you put the piece of poly on the front, Oh, that you, Dave, can you hold the prop a little higher? Sorry, yeah, yeah, I can. Perfect, thank you. Okay, on this piece of plastic here, or on the one you make yourself, you're going to put caulking. 
all right? Around here like this, all the way around. I'm not gonna put it on my fingers. All the way around. Ah, and then you're gonna put on the big sheet of poly right on top of it like this. You can then cut out the inside so you can put a plug in there and you can look at it and you can think that's perfect. Cost of this is nothing. This is not difficult. There aren't any trades out there that have set themselves out to do this. As soon as you can do one, and I'm sure you'll do a little slowly, you can do the next one. You'll get really good at it. And you will probably, by doing this, increase the value of your insulation in your, in your at, uh, basement, I would say by 100%, the effect, 100. You're gonna double the value. You're gonna spend $5,000 uh, you know, doing the insulation in the stud wall and the drywall. And on this, you're going to spend a total, uh, doing a whole basement of three bucks. And you're going to double the value of insulation in the attic. It is that simple. But you need to do it well. It, it's a thing that needs to be done by people that are proud. If, if you're good at doing things, if you're good at wrapping presents, if you're good at cooking meals, you can do it. This doesn't take skill. This just takes a little understanding and make it. Don't be, don't be in a rush. All those things that you might think about doing that are offered in the commercial market, a little piece of foam, a special cover. If that makes you feel good, do it. But if you want to solve the problem and do it well, this thing will never fail. If you do this right, this is good for 150 years. And you will get the benefit of that every single day. Uh, th those are three little ideas about air loss that can be addressed by people of no special skill, not much money. These will make a real difference. And once you start along this path, you'll want to do more and better things. But I think for now, I want to leave you with these. And I want to thank Green Venture, especially Environment Hamilton and the city for the opportunity, because these kinds of things simply make sense. I apologize that, that major governments are not helping you understand the problem and come up with solutions. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dave. And I think that brings us to our next slide, which is about um, what your next steps might be. Making these small, impactful uh, changes to your home, as Dave mentioned, is a great way to get started, feel more confident, and also get curious and start making improvements to your home. We work with something called the spectrum of retrofit streams. So these kind of upgrades would be under these, like more towards the minor energy efficiency changeouts, and then to, towards the five to 20%. You can make these kind of changes and make a large impact in your home for, as we said, very little money. Moving forward into the further uh, retrofit streams, you might make some energy conservation measures along the lines of doing air sealing, adding insulation, um, you know, improving your ability to heat your home through your water heating, space heating, things like that. What we are aiming for to meet our net zero goals overall is a somewhere along the lines of a 50% reduction in gigajoule usage in the majority of homes in this country. Um, and that is something that we qualify as a deep energy retrofit. So that involves some level of major air sealing, insulating the attic and things like that. But you don't have to start with the big stuff. You are perfectly able to start towards the other end and work your way up. We can get our next slide. And when you're ready to do more, um, we recommend that we showed you the hierarchy of um, retrofit. Towards the bottom of it is an area that says just recognize. So that can look like getting curious about your house. That can look like joining webinars like this one. That can look like reading, looking on the internet for information, getting curious about your house specifically, where you're losing um, heat, where you're lo losing air, where your home is not efficient. It can also look like getting an EnerGuide evaluation. This is something where you will have an energy expert come to your home and do a comprehensive evaluation that calculates the total energy consumption of your house and identifies weak points. See if you wanna take it away. Yeah, thanks so much.
Uh, so I will talk about uh, what an Energide energy assessment or evaluation is uh, essentially uh, when it, one of our registered energy advisors uh, registered through Natural Resources Canada uh, will come to your house and essentially uh, do an energy assessment takes around two to three hours depending on the size of your house um, and essentially the advisor will um, start from the basement and go all the way up to your attic. Uh, they will you know, look at your current heating and cooling systems in your house, whether that be your uh, gas furnace, your natural gas furnace, uh, an air conditioner that you may have, a, and a water heater. These are typically all in your basement. Uh, and they will um, look at the efficiency of these systems and then move uh, throughout your house uh, to look at, you know, both the um, exterior uh, of your building envelope and the interior of your building envelope. Um, they will look at your windows and doors uh, to see the size and the type and the location of all of your windows and doors um, and how efficient these are currently. And also uh, we'll look at your insulation levels throughout your house. Um, and they will use a, um, a blower door test in order to identify uh, any areas of leakage, of air leakage uh, that is coming from your house. So where cold air is leaking into your house and your air from indoors is leaking out. This also will help uh, to measure if you are getting adequate fresh air in your house. And uh, essentially, um, this is important for, uh, you know, monitoring where you can do some of these small improvements. And the registered energy advisor will go uh, take you through as uh, this blower door test is happening. Uh, they will take you through the house to and show you where air is leaking into your house and where you are losing uh, heat. Um, and this blower door test is hooked up to a computer system uh, that the energy advisor uh, brings with them and it will calculate how many uh, air changes, uh, how much the air is changing in your house per hour. Uh, and essentially all of this information is important um, towards gathering, you know, the correct data and information that will be all put together into a uh, into a report uh, after your energy audit is done. And essentially the energy audit report will show you where you're currently sitting at in terms of uh, your current efficiency of your house uh, and where you can start to make those improvements. So here we see uh, typically the uh, what is called the renovation upgrade report. It will require it will show a year a roadmap, and this roadmap will be the recommendations that the energy advisor has made specifically to your home. And uh, so specifically your um, perhaps your heating system may need an upgrade. Perhaps you can upgrade your cooling heating and cooling system, maybe using a heat pump, uh, upgrading um, your hot water uh, system, maybe to a hot water heat pump air sealing, increasing your insulation levels. There will be a variety of recommendations um, throughout this report. Typically it is, um, you know, around uh, very detailed. So it can be around, you know, 10 pages of um, lots of details for you to, um, you know, start to make these uh, energy efficiency upgrades. Um, and then at the bottom, it will also show you how much, uh, you know, uh, your greenhouse gas emissions you are reducing if you do make these changes and uh, how many tons of um, emissions you will be reducing from your house. Because if you remember back to our, uh, our slide about uh, building emissions in the GTHA, 46% are coming from the building sector alone. So the buildings meaning our homes. And so that is where we can make a lot of these improvements using um, an energy audit. And uh, that is why an energy audit that we offer at Green Venture um, is a, a helpful way for you to get to know your house better 
and also to improve your energy efficiency at your house as well. So, so let's move forward. So we do have a little bit of time set aside to answer any questions that you folks have that have come up um, throughout this discussion. We will get started with one that was put in the chat. And if you have any more, feel free to comment them. So here we go. So Dave, I'm gonna pass this along to you. When putting poly over the light fixture in the attic, won't there be a problem with heat on the poly? Is the poly heat resistant? All right, that, that's a good question. We were worried about that in our business uh, because the approach we used was uh, started in uh, Saskatoon in the Saskatchewan Research Council. And what I'm suggesting is exactly what they did. We did a bad approach for uh, 30 years. That doesn't mean it was perfect. We were worried about the buildup of heat. Uh, we were assured that it, uh, it wasn't a problem. And I think um, in general, it, you know, it, it, it is not a problem. For those that are concerned, there are probably applications in a normal light that I'm not thinking about. For instance, there used to be things called sun lamps and there could be heating lamps, things that are intentionally manufactured to create a lot of heat. If there is any chance that you thought that this was gonna be uh, uh, utilized, I would definitely add some sort of a spacer. Maybe it would be a chicken wire or something. It might set the poly back maybe a half an inch from the metal octagon box. Uh, and and while, while I'm at this topic, so if, if you wanted to be more careful, I'm sure this meets the code, but if you want to be more careful, I would somehow put a, a, some sort of a spacer to elevate the poly maybe a half inch but here's something you need to consider. Pot lights, the pot lights are hot. They're a different kettle of fish altogether. You would not put a piece of poly up and immediately touching the box you get when you're installing pot, pot lights. You would build a frame of some sort around the pot light to keep the poly an inch or two away from that light. So. Good question. I, I think if you want to go beyond the code or beyond what you might be tempted at, I mean, maybe people are going to heat their houses with sun lamps in the future. But uh, by our experience and our research tells us this is all appropriate. It's not just in the code, but it makes sense. And, and uh, in usually speaking, we're using these fancy new light bulbs that don't create heat. So for the new lighting, but we should be prepared in case somebody wants to use the old lighting. So I'm sorry for a long-winded answer, but by and large, the normal application, this is sound advice. Awesome. Thanks so much, Dave. Um, and then we have another question in the chat, which is, do heat pumps work well in our area with such large changes in temperature? When do heat pumps need to be covered? Uh, Dee, I think you might have some. Things about yeah. That. Yeah, so I can chat a little bit to this. Obviously, any specific information that is um, regarding heat pumps, um, I can give a general overview, a very high level broad uh, view, but um, more specifics would be something that needs to be asked of your energy advisor if you do have a, a home energy assessment and or uh, a heat pump contractor or an HVAC contractor. So you would ask them the specific questions. Um, if you, for instance, if you do already have a heat pump installed at your house that you are looking to have, you know, covered up or um, yeah, more specific questions about that. But in general, do heat pumps work well in our area with such large changes in temperature? I would say because we are situated in Hamilton, and some people are in Niagara region as well. A lot, a large um, swath of our our clients with Green Venture are in St. Catharines or or Niagara on the Lake, um, all the way down to um, Port uh, Colburn and Fort Erie. Uh, I would say these temperatures typically are weather in especially in the winter times 
uh, don't get as harsh as some other areas of the province. And um, so heat pumps actually do work uh, relatively well. Um, you know, a variety of heat pumps go down to around, if you have a cold climate heat pump installed, a cold climate heat pump uh, typically can work to around negative 15 degrees Celsius. Um, even, and that is just a general, that's a general ballpark. Some may yeah, and even some go work up to negative 30. It yeah. depends on the unit. Exactly. So it depends on the unit. Um, it depends on the size of your house as well. If you have a smaller unit for a smaller house or more uh, larger units for larger homes. So uh, it really depends. And that's why you would specifically ask for um, that question to your heat pump contractor or an energy advisor that knows your home. Uh, but uh, cold climate heat pumps are out there. And the benefit is that when we have our really hot temperatures in the summer, a heat pump also moves that heat from inside your house when it gets really hot to the outside and helps to cool your home in the summer. So that's the nice part is that it provides both heating and cooling, um, not just heating in the winter only. Um, yeah, so um, that is uh, hopefully gives a, a broad overview answer. Um, but in terms of do heat pumps need to be covered? I'm not uh, I, I want to be honest, I, I don't know the answer to that question, um, whether, you know, it needs to be covered up or not. I don't believe so. Um, I know it has to be lifted up in this picture on the Q&A. You can kind of see it is uh, the heat pump is elevated. This is a picture of a heat pump, by the way. So you can see the heat pump is elevated off the ground a little bit on these sort of that little metal platform. Um, so I know it has to be elevated. Don't believe it has to be covered. Um, but obviously don't quote me on that. Um, and, uh, yeah, thanks so much for your question. Great. And then we have one more question that is, are heat pumps noisy? Um, I can speak to this a little bit, which is that heat pumps do make a noise. Uh, it's typically categorized as white noise because it is fairly quiet and consistent. So it kind of fades into the background in the same way as like an air conditioner might things along that line they're not typically found to be much louder than the average air conditioner um if that is helpful to answer your question and i will also just say we do green venture has done a heat pump webinar uh in the past so if that would be helpful for you to view and learn just more general information about heat pumps then uh, we can send that out after this event and um, and and link that uh, recording because that is also posted to our YouTube channel with Green Venture. So um, yeah, you're more than welcome to learn more general facts about heat pumps there and we can send that out with the recording. All right, we have some interest in the heat pump recording so we will follow up after this, um, after we wrap up here, we'll follow up with the link to our heat pump recording. All right, and I'll give a couple more minutes for anyone else to put any of the questions they have in the chat. In the meantime, thank you all so much for joining us today. Uh, once again, we do have uh, a recording of this event uh, that will be sent out and also we do have, um, as you are thinking of questions, if you have any lingering burning questions, uh, we will stop the recording at one o'clock. Uh, but if you do have lingering questions, you would like to ask uh, ourselves at the energy team, or you would like to ask Dave, we will stick around for um, a couple minutes after one o'clock. Also, we'd really like to all invite you to our Ask the Experts uh, event that will be held on April 14th. That is a Sunday at Eco House. So this will be an in-person event. We're going to have Dave there as well. And also one of our registered energy advisors, Dean. Uh, Dean Anderson will, he's our senior energy advisor and he will be there also to ask or to answer any questions and provide almost like a mini consultation. So uh, if you have any specific questions about your home, uh, and what retrofits may be most appropriate for your home. Uh, we will have them both there on that Sunday. Um, and 
we would uh, be more than happy to have you out on that day as well. Yeah. All right, so let's go to our final slide and we'll do a little bit of a wrap up here. All right, so we'd like to thank you all so much for joining us here today. Um, your questions were fabulous. Thanks so much for participating, being with us in this space. Um, so we are representatives of Green Venture. On the slide, you can see our service areas um, in the thing. Oh, we do have a quick question. Does Green Venture offer blower door test services unrelated to any government programs? That's something that we are currently um, working on. If you'd like, you can send us a quick email um, to discuss further because we do have energy advisors and we do think that the blower door test is a very valuable um, piece of information to have. Yeah, you can feel free to send us an email to energy at greenventure.ca, which is in the chat. And we'd like to give also a special thanks to Environment Hamilton and Hamilton's Office of Climate Change Initiatives for all of their support throughout this webinar series. And I think we're set to stop the recording there. Yes, thank you everyone. I will also stop sharing. And stop recording.